My name is Alicia Liggett. I'm a physician, a family practice doctor that works um, out of the Bronx. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, uh, black queer patients of color and also women of color, uh, providing primary care services, gender affirming services, and everything in between that's, that's health related. Um, a lot of what I do is also not health related just because there are a lot of other issues that intertwine very closely with health, um, like a person's housing status, um, um, a person's employment status, um, access to food, these kinds of things. So um, I believe that healthcare is one of those institutions where you really see a nexus of all of the social determinants that kind of come to a head as it relates to someone's health. Um, yes, I think that, you know, this, this is a very, um, interesting time in 2020, um, just in that, you know, there's a lot of activism around, um, around protecting black lives, um, all black lives that is, and that includes, uh, black, queer, and trans lives as well, um, as it relates to equity and equality in all systems and equal treatment. Um, as well as recognizing the humanity and all of us as individuals that we deserve to be treated fairly, um, both interpersonally, but also in the eyes of all of the systems that we engage with. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a little bit of background about my philosophy as well as what I do. Um, generally, I bring that philosophy to really everything that I do when I engage with patients individually, when Patients tell me their stories, uh, their experiences, when they share very intimate details about themselves that have um, a dramatic bearing on their health. So yeah, I really kind of think about barriers for, um, for queer and trans individuals really in three layers. Um, you have you know, the systemic layers, which are you know, the medical system, the health system itself. The, the, the barriers that are built into that. Um, those barriers are often related to accessing the care that they need. Um, they're related to um, preventing them for be, from being able to have, um, getting medic medications that they may need or getting uh, surgeries that maybe, maybe they need. Um, so for example, in the case particularly of, um, of trans individuals, transgender individuals that there are, there are many barriers in terms of medical letters that are required for, um, for them to undergo surgeries, um, psychological evaluations, um, you know, this idea of regret that people are going to regret having surgery or taking, you know, gender affirming uh, medications. And, you know, that just really hasn't borne out in the literature. Um, those are all barriers that are placed in front of, in front of them so they're not really able to access the care that in many cases is life-saving for people. Um, so yeah, so those things are kind of written into the code of healthcare. Um, they're often dictated by health insurance companies in terms of what they will and won't pay for based on, oftentimes not even based on actual science or data. Um, so you know, those, those issues can be, can be very, um, very annoying and they're much harder to change because it really requires um, an interplay of many different systems, including the clinics, the hospitals, the insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies and pharmacies and middle managers and all of these systems that have to interplay to kind of make these very small changes. So, um, so that is a huge, huge barrier. Um, also, in terms of the interpersonal piece of it, um, people, uh, you know, black, queer and trans individuals who actually come in, to, like seek care, um, will often face interpersonal discrimination from, um, from people who work in healthcare, who um, either haven't been trained or have really no understanding um, of, you know, where this person is coming from or what their lived experience is like. Um, people can also face uh, discrimination and bias from providers, from doctors, uh, from nurses, from really anyone that works within the system that they interact with that may, and it may come in the form of, you know, glaring stares or um, uncomfortable comments or, um, you know, dismissal of one's feelings, uh, of one's thoughts, ideas about their own body. Um, 
in the form of like taking patriarchal attitudes as if people don't know what's best for themselves. Um, so that piece of it can really kind of provide barriers and that people can't, don't feel open, they don't feel comfortable, they don't feel um, as if the healthcare system really recognizes them and respects them in a way that um, they feel comfortable sharing their lived experience and, and also feel comfortable seeking care. And I think that kind of relates also to the third barrier, which is really more internalized, where people kind of internalize the stigma that is uh, placed upon them by the external factors, by society, um, you know, unreasonable standards, um, you know, in terms of the medical institutions placing um, these barriers to care. People kind of internalize that as, well, something's wrong with me or, uh, you know, I, I really don't want to deal with the system, so I'm just not going to seek care at all. Um, and so, you know, that may translate into fear. And with that fear, people may, you know, wait longer to really access care for really critical health health issues um, that really can affect their health and it can be life and death for them. So, um, yeah, so those are kind of the, the three barriers and they all kind of interplay with one another. I definitely feel like, you know, in kind of really dismantling racism and discrimination against all Black individuals, including Black queer individuals, uh, we really have to kind of take a multifaceted approach to this, right? Because there's just so many dimensions and so many levels. Um, I think for sure at the level of, you know, it definitely starts with uh, you know, raising our voices, uh, being advocates for ourselves, um, being empowered with information. That's super important because as we see with these movements uh, for Black lives that, you know, you have millions of people all over the country, all over the world. I mean, Black Lives Matter movement has really transcended the United States. And we recognize that the issue of Black lives is, is, is an issue all over the world. From the Arab world, I'm seeing articles and newspapers and in the Arab media about Black Lives Matter, um, you know, as it pertains to Black Arabs, as it pertains to, you know, Black Latinas, you know. And so this is really a global movement where everyone is really coming together to raise their voices and stand together and say, we, will, we no longer want to tolerate this discrimination. And that's really kind of what makes people take note, like, wow, this is something that we actually do need to reevaluate, right? Um, that, you know, really forces the people who are, are in control of the systems to take note and think about how we can be more inclusive about allowing, you know, these voices to shine through so that we can make the necessary changes um, that are required to really bring equity to everyone and be more inclusive to everyone. So I definitely feel like it starts with that. Um, and, I, and that part of it, I love. I love the energy of activism. I love when people take to the streets. I love when people, you know, get on their social medias and they, you know, speak their mind and they say what's on their mind. I love when people, you know, share their stories and share their, their experiences because that is like super powerful. Telling your own, you're telling your story and sharing your experiences because then people can place a name and a face to the movement, right? Uh, and stories, because people tend to remember stories. Um, and so it'd be moved by stories. It'd be, it'd be moved into to action by stories. So I think definitely that is super important for people to continue to tell their stories, to raise, raise their voices. And I really feel like Black, queer, and trans individuals have to lead the, the charge on that. You know, we have to really, and, and, and people who are you know allies or advocates of that struggle also you know, can can follow their lead, follow their direction, um, because it is really their experience. Um, however, there is a lot of intersection um, in terms of the types of discrimination with the intersectionality between, you know, what um, trans women, for example, black trans women face. Um, and so, yeah, it's that's super important. And then I think it's gonna also be about changing laws. It's gonna be about dismantling structures and rebuilding them again. It's gonna be really about um, looking, taking a very deep dive historically uh, into how these systems were built under you know which uh, philosophical tenets they were built, which were often based on tenets of racism and discrimination um, and really kind of changing the rules changing the laws such that they reflect equity um, because they are inherently inequitable.
Intersectionality is really the interplay of identities, right? Overlapping identities that within the individual and how those identities then affect their health outcomes, right? So for example, um, you know, poverty, um, being black, uh, being queer, those three things, um, have being unstably housed, that's a fourth dimension. Um, having, you know, issues of uh, mental health issues or a disability, that could be a fifth dimension. I mean, all of these things would basically, and they've been shown to, that these individuals have poor outcomes when it comes to their health, um, primarily based on some of the issues that I mentioned in terms of um, difficulty accessing care, racism and discrimination within healthcare, the um, differences in what's offered to them in terms of treatment options, and and also what insurances will pay for, which largely determines, um, you know, the types of treatments and the types of medications that people are offered. Um, and oftentimes that's very inequitable, you know, when you compare across, you know, public versus private insurances. So, you know, that, that intersectionality, you know, really does dramatically affect one's health. Um, if, for example, if you look at the case of, um, you know, HIV, now we're seeing that the one of the highest, um, you know, populations that are most becoming most affected uh, with the HIV infection are um, are queer individuals, right? Um, and also, Black women are behind that, uh, shortly, behind, you know, closely behind that. Um, and you know, it's even estimated that as many as fifty percent of you know transgender women have HIV as well. So when you kind of look at these, when you start to kind of unpack, um, you know these specific demographic identities um, and how they correlate so closely with health outcomes, you really see that we do ha kind of have to start to, uh, you know, unpack how and why these things occur. What are the conditions such that um, they put people in vulnerable situations such, such that they um, then become susceptible to diseases like HIV, for example, right? Um, because it's not just about behavior, right? It's about, in some cases, life choice for some people, right? Like, I can say that as a woman who's homeless or as a woman who has food insecurity or as a woman who uh, has poor supports within her family or in her community, that yes, she is gonna be more likely to engage in, you know, transactional sex or survival sex in order to get what it is she needs to live. Um, so those, you know, those things, those needs, those basic necessities really drive our behavior. It's not necessarily something that's inherently bad with individuals that make them susceptible to poor health outcomes. In many cases, it's their environment, it's their upbringing, it's uh, resources that really determine that. And that's kind of what I feel also, the Black Lives Matter movement, as it relates to healthcare, really needs to focus on. The voices of queer and trans people are so strong in New York City. It's not to say that they don't experience discrimination, but you know, in comparison to other places, for example, the southeastern United States, where you know, li literally people will shut their doors to queer and trans people. Um, it's not that overt here. You know, I would say it's more. Um, it's more of the interpersonal racism that people experience and the interpersonal bias and discrimination um, when they're seeking care. Um, yes, it is true that, you know, these laws, these protections are in effect. However, um, how, how do we enforce that? How do we move forward from that, right? Like, how, how is it that we can, how is it that we can mentally retrain individuals such that they understand that, you know, this type of behavior, bias, discrimination is not okay. It's actually inhumane. It's a violation of human rights. Um, getting people to understand the serious, seriousness of that, because it is one thing to change laws and to add these protections, which is wonderful. However, the hard work is really, you know, at the individual levels and the local systemic levels where these, um, you know, these, protections have to be instituted and they have to be policed, right? To ensure that people are adhering to these, adhering to these standards. So how do we do that, right? That's really the hard work. This is a March for Human Rights, 
right? I mean, this is a march for equity. Um, this is a march for, I don't even want to say recognition necessarily, but yes, recognition of one's humanity. Um, so, you know, all those things are, I feel like just kind of hit to the core of the core principles of really what this country is supposed to be founded on, right? Is, you know, that every person is, you know, is, um, is entitled to their inalienable rights, right? Uh, to be protected. Um, so I think for me, that's really the most important thing. And, you know, if you're a human and you're existing in this world and in this planet, you know, in, in a community, like none of us exist in a vacuum. We exist in social circles of friends and family and communities and neighbors and cities and states and countries. And, you know, the humanity, the human story, you know, of brutality and death um, and suffering really is something that every human being can relate to um, and understand and feel at their core. So kind of knowing that, I would say that, you know, this is really a march for that, um, to have our humanity recognized. With healthcare, there's just so many issues, I think, with disparity and access and, you know, unfortunately the healthcare system we, is, is really a two-tiered system that, um, that really splits people between the haves and the have-nots. People who have uh, Medicaid and Medicare, the people who have commercial or private insurances, and really where you go, where you seek care, the opportunities that are granted to you in terms of which doctors you see and um, you know even which um, studies that you might be offered, which types of surgeries you might be offered are all determined upon that. Um, you know, so healthcare has a long way to go. I'm a proponent of a single payer system, <laughs> but obviously we, we tried that when uh, President Obama was in office and, you know, unfortunately we ended up with the ACA, uh, Obamacare, which is a good start, but definitely we need to go further than that. And now it's being actively dismantled. Um, so yeah, we're kind of all wondering where do we go from here, especially after COVID where we really did start to see um, some of the major deficiencies in our healthcare systems and how so many people literally fell through the cracks. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think only time will tell, um, you know, if we're able to really kind of come together and, and fix this. But when I think of Black queer liberation, I get these images in my mind of, um, you know, Black people marching in the streets arm in arm with their signs, you know, that represent their lived experience, um, showing and telling the world that, yes, I do matter, my life matters, my life is valuable, my child's life is valuable, my community's life is valuable. Um, and with that, I deserve uh, equal opportunity, I deserve um, to have access to clean water, I deserve to have access to equitable, you know, high quality health care. Um, that I deserve to uh, be able to, you know, live in a safe community. I, I deserve to be able to live my life free from the fear of police brutality or um, police harassment. Um, that I deserve to be treated equitably under the law if I do happen to interact with the healthcare system. Um, these are all things that I deserve and that, you know, that we're gonna march proudly and we're gonna scream loudly until those things happen. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, and it's all happening in color. <laughs> you know, it really just, you know, people marching arm in arm of all, diverse spectrums, backgrounds, um, gender identities, um, because of course, black and brown people are extremely diverse in their skin color and their experiences and where they come from and linguistically, and just all of that kind of coming together, um, fighting for a singular cause, despite, you know, despite the diversity. So yeah, so that's what I would say it looks like for me. I've always known that I've wanted to be a physician since I was 
you know, nine or 10 years old when I saw my mom, who was a nurse's aide, um, you know, she would go home to home and care for a lot of our community's elderly who didn't have a lot of social supports or family around. She would drag me along to help her clean houses and cook for, old, for elderly people and just ensure that nobody in the community was really left behind, that there wasn't anyone who didn't have someone to call if they needed something. And that kind of always stuck with me, that image of caregiving and how powerful that can be. Um, I remember, you know, as we would leave these homes, like people would just be so grateful that um, that she not only took the time to come and see them, to come check on them, to come ensure that they had groceries, that their kitchen was clean, um, and sit and talk with them and laugh with them and tell stories, but that 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 she recognized the humanity in them, right? That they were humans and that even though they were elderly or disabled or, you know, what society would kind of cast away as individuals who don't have any value, that in her eyes, that everyone has value. Um, and that's just the kind of doctor I wanted to be. And I always knew that I wanted to work in communities of color. You know, I always knew that I wanted to work with, um, with queer and trans individuals, uh, with black women. Uh, I, I knew that I wanted to work in primary care um, to really provide a broad spectrum of care to everyone um, and to anyone who needed it or who sought it. Um, so for me, it's really more of a calling um, and less about, um, you know, less about, oh, I'm in it for the prestige or money or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I love working in my community. I feel comfortable there. Um, I feel as if people are, you know, there's a huge need, first of all, uh, because there's a huge shortage of providers, a huge shortage of doctors, nurses, uh, because in many cases, people choose not to work in these communities, um, which is also part of the racism, right? Like much rather kind of work in communities where it's, you know, mostly white, upper class, well to do people versus individuals who are, you know, who are poorer and individuals who are immigrants and, you know, all of the intersectional things that we've spoken about before. Um, but for me, you know, I really believe that a society is judged uh, based on how they treat its most vulnerable population. Um, and with that, I think it's our duty, it's everyone's duty to ensure that no one falls through the net. Um, so for me, that, that was really the draw for me to ensure that, you know, I was in a place where my community could access me, um, where people could get the kind of care that they needed and that they deserved. You know, I would say maybe six or seven years ago is when kind of this whole, where it really be kind of started to become very popular about providing, um, gender affirming care to queer and trans individuals and, um, providing um, you know, a wide spectrum of primary care to, to these individuals as well. And I remember for many of us, this was new medicine, right? Like it's not something that we were trained to do in medical school or in residency, you know, and because medicine just advances at such a rapid rate, you know, there are those of us who are kind of called the cowboys, which I was called, which are cowgirls, I should say, or cow people. <laughs> who are who are like, yeah, I'll embrace a new technique. I'll embrace a new idea, way of thinking. I'll embrace a, a new way of practicing medicine if it means that it's going to provide access to my community and equity, equi equity to my community and, and bring good health to my community. Sure, I'll learn to do that. I'll, you know, go the extra mile to, you know, read medical journals and attend conferences and uh, take part in CMEs and look at the historical lens so that I can create, you know, I can create an experience for my patients that feels authentic to them. Um, or I could just sit back and do nothing and just practice the way I've always practiced, right? Which is, you know, I think for the first couple of years is where a lot of people were. Um, and I think that your interpersonal, your experience, I think your life, your personality kind of really determines whether or not you're going to be somebody who's going to go gung ho about jumping on to this thing or whether you're just going to sit back and say, hmm, no thanks, you know, which is also you know, leaves things open to discrimination, right? And bias where 
if individuals walk into your office and they're seeking this this care and you're like, oh, we don't do that. Well, I don't believe in that. There's no such thing as that. It's the, you know, you can't tell people we don't do that, like, or we don't want to care for you because. Um, and and I've seen this happen across healthcare, uh, with you know, based on people's gender gender spectrum, uh, based on their race, based on their disability status, based on their educational level. Um, you know, based on how much money they have, based on how they're dressed, based on how their hair looks, what color their hair is. I, I mean, I've seen it and it still happens. Um, so, you know, these are all things that uh, for me are just are super important and are always kind of at the forefront of my mind. This work is super important though. I mean, I think definitely it's important to leave no no black life behind, and that includes queer and trans lives. And I believe that, um, particularly with many social movements, um, where you're kind of gathering large groups of people to for you know to make systemic changes, um, sometimes the stories of the minority gets lost in the folds, and we have to make sure that doesn't happen that really everybody's stories and everybody's um, issues kind of have a place in the forefront. So I think, you know, it's super important to ensure that yes, Black Lives Matter, but all Black Lives Matter and that no one should be left behind in this struggle.